estimation formats, it is not easy for me to unrar files. And it makes my life more annoying. Uh, and I don't want to make your lives more annoying because I'm annoyed. Um, and finally, a couple of you used uh, later uh, used features of, of uh, the JVM uh, SDK uh, greater than 1.6. Um, you were not penalized for this, but as a courtesy to me and uh, as a way of hopefully preserving my sanity so that in my sanity I can give you a, a good grade, uh, please don't use features like generic type inference and uh, strings and switches. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out a way of, of sort of validating, uh, giving you guys more uh, immediate feedback on whether or not your submission is testable. Uh, using using the automated testing scripts that I'm, I'm using, uh, but just as a, a quick heads up, please try and follow these guidelines. Uh, one additional request: uh, make 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 my life easy. Uh, follow the instructions for for the team files. One UBIT per line. Uh, this is uh, again something that is uh, I I can't believe how many different variations of this I got. Um, U-bits, U-bits only, nothing else. Okay, uh, quick note on the grading for the assignment. Uh, the grading went almost exactly like it was uh, described in the file. Uh, the relational algebra tests, and uh, I added a couple of, rela of relational algebra tests. Those were worth 60 points in total. Um, very few people in the class actually were able to successfully parse a group by aggregate query, so I'm not penalizing anyone who didn't. Uh, instead, anyone who did successfully earned uh, up to five bonus points on that question. Um, essentially, if you successfully ran all of the tests that I provided you, that's worth 40 points. And then finally, the, as mentioned, uh, submitting for the original deadline earned you an extra 20 points as well. Uh, basic stats. Uh, there were a fair range of different uh, results um, of the projects that successfully compiled. Uh, there was an average of about 92, uh, point, uh, people got a grade of about 92, uh, with a standard deviation of 24.9. Um, okay, any questions on this? So once again, uh, I'll hopefully be emailing you those grades uh, before Wednesday. With any luck, uh, even today. Uh, further quick reminder, uh, next Monday is March 4th, which, uh, as those of you who paid attention at the very beginning, uh, will recall is the midterm date. Uh, this includes all material up to and including what we covered last week, uh, that is to say, uh, up to and including optimization. Uh, exact chapter numbers and section numbers are uh, available in the syllabus, which has been updated. Uh, and just to, to uh, restate it, um, nothing we cover this week will be on the midterm. Okay, so um, that out of the way, let's uh, get to today's topic. Um, we're going to get into the nitty gritty bits of a database. Uh, basically, we'll try and talk about uh, what makes databases work quickly. Or how, how can databases uh, satisfy lots and lots of requests uh, very fast. Now, in order to uh, address that question, we need to take a look at what kind of uh, data we're going to be processing. Now, there are two, uh, there's a lot of different styles of databases, but the, the by far the two most dominant approaches are uh, something called online analytical processing, which basically focuses on large static data, that is to say large unchanging data, uh, and typically, queries in this case are really big. They require processing lots and lots of data. But that data is fairly static. On the other hand, there's uh, the, the other major type of workload is something called online transaction processing. And in this case, uh, the, the distinction is that you have lots and lots of queries, uh, but those queries are typically affecting uh, much smaller chunks of data. Um, and the, the big distinction here is that that data is being changed. Uh, the operations, various operations are being performed uh, to modify that data uh, at some uh, fairly high rate. Uh, 
And this is the kind of workload that we're going to be focusing on over the course of this week, uh, online transaction processing. Now, as I said, the, the key feature of this workload is that there's lots and lots of data manipulations. And typically, these data manipulations are going to be small and relatively compact. And that, in turn, means that these uh, workloads tend to have lot, uh, very large amounts of IOs, and specifically write IOs. So essentially, our, our main goal uh, in order to make these run fast is going to be uh, to keep the disk as active as possible. Because as we talked about earlier in the course, uh, the big blocker uh, for most queries is I.O. So if we can keep lots and lots of queries running in parallel, that's going to make our, uh, keep our uh, disk active, that's going to keep our I.O. Uh, bus saturated, and that's going to keep our latencies low. Um, and we, how, how, did, how this all fits into the database is that the database is essentially responsible for making sure that these, do, these various transactions don't step on each other's toes. Uh, it's the database's responsibility to make sure that the, the, trans that the operations that the user is requesting to be performed on the database uh, get performed uh, correctly. Now that, of course, leads to a, a, a very open-ended question. Uh, what does it mean for a database operation to be correct? Thoughts? Okay, so uh, as a very high level, you could say that uh, transactions aren't allowed to be interleaved at all. Um, and that is, strictly speaking, correct. Um, if, if, there are no inter uh, if you're only allowed to execute one transact or one op set of operations at a time, uh, then you could use that as a baseline uh, for, for judging the correctness of a set of, data, of, of those, uh, of how the database handles those operations. Um, of course, is that going to be particularly efficient? If you're not allowed to uh, interleave different database operations? No? No? Okay. Uh, essentially, if you can only run one at a time, then you're, you're, you're bound uh, by how fast you can process each transaction. Okay, um, now I'm leaving this term database operation a little bit uh, vague. So typically, how does a, how does a database interact with uh, various uh, entities that use the data in the database? So we've been focusing on at least one of them for most of the, the course. Yeah, so SQL. Uh, the database interacts basically through a series of, uh, of, of queries. And what can a query do? Yes, so it can create data and it can uh, pull, uh, pull data back. Or it can modify data uh, and it can uh, access data. Now, does the database uh, know anything about how that data is being used once it leaves the database? So if you, uh, if you run a query, uh, say, select, um, select all of these account numbers. Uh, sorry, select all of these account balances. Um, does the database know how, uh, what happens in between that select uh, account number and... So let's say that the database sees two operations. Uh, first, a user comes along and selects all of the account balances, and then a second operation where the user comes along and overwrites all of those account balances with new ones. Um, does the database know anything about how, what the connection is between those? No. Exactly. So essentially, the, the database doesn't really know about the, the <coughs> excuse me, the logic that ha um, any of the business logic that goes into uh, how how that goes into components of, of the system outside of the database. All of the database knows is what data gets written and what data gets read. And so this is going to be sort of the fundamental uh, construct that we're going to use in order to guarantee this, this correctness property, this, this open-ended correctness property. So as I said, uh, the database interacts with, uh, with the user by providing it with a series of reads and a series of writes. And 
We're going to take these operations and we're going to group them together into something called a transaction. Um, and we're going to provide transactions, these transactions, with a set of guarantees. And the first guarantee that we're going to provide is that as far as the user is concerned, and uh, just a quick note, uh, whenever, whenever I say the word user in this case, uh, there's nothing to say that it has to be a human user. Uh, some application could be issuing SQL commands uh, just as well as a, a user. Uh, but essentially, from the, the user's perspective, uh, each transaction gets executed in its entirety and independent of any other transaction in the system. So if there are two transactions, uh, no matter how those transactions are actually executed, um, the, tra uh, the transaction is perceived by the user as having executed uh, in its entirety. Uh, and the second guarantee that we're going to provide is that each transaction uh, preserves uh, data consistency. Now, um, what does it mean for data to be correct? Or put another way, does the database care? Uh, does the database care whether or not, uh, let's say, if I were to withdraw money from one account and transfer it into another account, uh, does the database know anything about uh, that, that, uh, that we want that operation to be a zero-sum operation? No. Does the database know anything about uh, what it means for a user's account balance to be correct? Or let's say, is, uh, is there any situation uh, What's stopping the database from having some, uh, giving someone a negative balance, for example? Constraints. Right. So essentially, the, the database, uh, just as a quick recap, doesn't actually know anything about uh, what it means for the data to be correct, other than what the users uh, provide it with. And the way they're going to provide the database with notions of correctness is this, uh, are these integrity constraints. Uh, so essentially, the transaction, the second guarantee that we're going to provide is that each uh, transaction um, ensures that the integrity constraints are preserved. And the database management system, once again, is responsible for providing these guarantees, uh, no matter how the transactions get executed. Now, there are two, uh, from a really high level, uh, there are two challenges uh, that come up when you're trying to do this. Now, the first, uh, as, as we said, uh, if uh, ideally we'd like transactions to be executed one at a time. Uh, execute one transaction in, in its entirety, then execute the next, then the next, then the next. That's the illusion we'd like to provide the user. On the other hand, uh, that's obviously not going to be super efficient. So, uh, we want to be able to have two transactions executing at the same time. So, how do we do that without having one of those tra uh, transactions uh, interact negatively with the other. And what does it mean for that uh, for two transactions to interact negatively? Second challenge um, is pertains more to consistency. So we want to, pre uh, we want to preserve consistency in the database. <coughs> and if we want to make sure that the consistency is preserved after every single transaction, um, then we have to watch out uh, for what will happen if the database crashes in the middle of the transaction. So what happens if, uh, if you're updating, if you're transferring funds from A's account to B's account, and you subtract funds from A's account, uh, but then before you uh, add the, the funds back to B's account, the system crashes. You're left in this sort of weird, inconsistent state. And so we want to avoid that. We'll be uh, addressing challenge two probably much more uh, towards the end of the week, uh, Friday or next uh, Wednesday. Um, but that's essentially going to be one, one of the, the two major components of, of transactions. Today we're going to focus more on the interleaving portion of this problem. Okay, so um, 
A transaction doesn't necessarily need to complete successfully. Uh, essentially, we want a transaction. Uh, a transaction is essentially this bundle of operations. And we want to ensure that that bundle of operations uh, gets applied to the database uh, as if it were just one, uh, one single operation. That is to say, we want to make sure that the transaction is at home. Uh, but we also want to leave the possibility that that transaction might fail, uh, that there might be some uh, event that leads to that transaction having to uh, abort itself. And so a transaction essentially can end in one of two states. It can end by committing or it can end by aborting. And if it ends by aborting, well, uh, all of its effects have to be undone. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to focus on this a bit more uh, later on uh, in the week. Uh, but there's this, uh, in order to support this, uh, we're going to provide this logging mechanism that allows us to essentially undo uh, transactions that we've uh, decided to avoid. Um, and sort of the, the key thing about this is that uh, if a transaction commits, uh, it's as if all of the op individual, op sorry, if a transaction commits, then all of its operations have to have uh, essentially executed. They have to be uh, flush to disk. They have to be uh, persistent. If a transaction, once a transaction commits, then it has committed. Uh, if a transaction aborts, then all of the operations have to be aborted. You can't have uh, some operations that get, uh, that persist past the abort. Everything has to be undone. And of course, there's this property that uh, there is some order in which the transactions commit. And we have to respect that order. We have to essentially provide uh, this illusion that all of the transactions are committing in some uh, sequence of, of uh, in some sequence. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same sequence. Uh, and it doesn't have to be the, the same order in which they actually commit. But there has to be essentially some sequence uh, of, of commits that gets us to this, this uh, well, uh, I'll give you an example of that in just a moment. Uh, but first, any, any questions up to this point? Okay, so let me move on to that example. <coughs> I have a, a pair of operations here. Um, and these, sorry, a pair of transactions, and each transaction has two operations. So what is, uh, loosely speaking, what is the first transaction doing, T1? Transfer, uh, taking, moving money from B to A, or moving something from B to A, let's call it money. Uh, all right, transaction two. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so what could go wrong? Let's say we didn't have any sort of transactions around this. Let's say we just had uh, these individual instructions. So what, uh, what could, if we were to just execute those instructions um, in any order we wanted, what could uh, potentially go wrong? Okay, so we could run A equals A plus 100, then credit the interest, and then run B equals B minus 100. What's the end result? B is equal to 100. Exactly, so the bank loses six bucks. Um, what about, uh, and are there any other possible uh, errors? Yeah. So you run A, uh, first this, then those two, and then that, and what does that result in? Well, ni neither A nor B get the interest in that case. So it's possible, you ideally want A or B to get the interest, but not both. Um, okay, so let's uh, 
turn that into, <coughs> into something more concrete. Uh, we have here time going down um, and, and a sequence of operations that is. So uh, is, is this a valid sequence of operations? First execute this, then execute that, then that, then that. Yes? Why? So what is it about um, this sequence of operations, and by the way, yes, right? Uh, what is it about this sequence of operations that differs from this sequence of operations? The first one is the same and uh, if T1 and T2 are uh, happening in the sequence of operations. Right, so the end result of this sequence of operations is essentially equivalent to executing T1 first and then T2. Is there any way just by, by sort of uh, looking at this uh, sequence of operations that you could get that? Or how, how, do you, um, how do you sort of uh, assure yourself that that's the case? one instruction, uh, and then you have this other instruction coming along that's executing in the middle of this, this other transaction. So there's... Well, you could just as easily execute one, two, three, four. I'm not doing any operation on B unless B is transaction. There we go. So uh, there, there is a set of dependencies. So if we've essentially committed to T1 executing first, uh, the first instruction of T1 modifies A. The second of the instruction of T, T1 modifies B. But after this point, we never modify A again, which means that we're safe. Uh, it's safe for us. Uh, to modify A in transaction T2. Whereas in this case, we execute, or this A, the A that gets read when we compute this value, is dependent on the value from T1. On the other hand, when we execute, uh, when we evaluate this B, that B uh, has not yet had a chance to read the value updated by, by T1. And as a consequence, that ends up being not okay. So loosely speaking, you can see this, uh, or at least from the from the database uh, from the database's perspective, um, you don't see the individual arithmetic that goes that goes on here. Uh, what you do see is um, essentially a series of reads and writes. So operation one reads from A, writes to A. Um, same here, reads from A, writes to A. <coughs> and the distinction is that this read, so T2, sees a value of A that was modified by T1. T1 sees a value of B that was modified by T2. So you have this, this sort of cy uh, this cycle. Uh, T1 depends on, or part of T1 depends on a value uh, generated by T2. Uh, T2 depends on a value generated by T1. And so there's no order uh, that you can place those two operations in uh, that would lead to uh, that would lead to the end result that you get as a result of executing these operations in this order. And so that's not okay. Any questions on the example? Okay. Um, <coughs> abstractly speaking, what we want to do is we have a sequence of, of operations that we need to do. Uh, we have a sequence of operations that we need to perform for each transaction. And we want to make sure that uh, that sequence of operations, uh, hit, or at least that the entire transaction, uh, we want to make sure that those operations don't step on each other's toes. And so in order to do this, 
we're going to define, uh, once again, correctness as, as this sort of abstract notion of a serial schedule. And a serial schedule is, as we defined earlier, um, a schedule that doesn't interleave anything. Um, basically, you execute one transaction in its entirety, then you execute another transaction, and another one, and another one. Um, we're also going to define uh, this, this notion of schedule equivalency. And the idea here is that, oh, sorry, uh, I'm not defining the term schedule. So a schedule is a sequence of database operations. This is, for example, a schedule. A bunch of reads, writes, and other things in a particular order. And a serial schedule is a, a schedule that doesn't do any sort of interleaving between transactions. You execute all of the operations of one transaction and all of the operations of another. We're going to define some notion of equivalency on the schedules. Uh, essentially, uh, regardless of what the database state is, we're going to say that two schedules are equivalent if, uh, regardless of what the, the database state is, um, the result of executing one schedule is identical to the result of executing the other. So now we have a notion of defining what we call a serializable schedule, which is that uh, a schedule is uh, called serializable if it is equivalent to some serial execution of the transactions. It doesn't matter which order the transactions uh, are executed in, but it just has to be equivalent to some serial order. <coughs> now, as a nice side effect of this, uh, if each individual transaction is guaranteed to preserve consistency, so basically if you do your, your integrity checks on each individual transaction, then by preserving serializability, uh, you also preserve uh, the, uh, the integrity constraints on the data as well. Any questions? Okay. So, um, now, what can go wrong with this schedule? Well, there are basically three major conflict types that could potentially arise in, uh, in this schedule. The first is that one transaction uh, reads data that it shouldn't have read. So, for example, if transaction one uh, performs a read, write, read, write, and then aborts. Meanwhile, transaction two reads the data that transaction one wrote. Um, well, this is, this is bad, because if transaction one aborts, then technically this write never happened, which means that this read was wrong. So that, this is uh, known as a write-read dependency, uh, because you have a write and then a subsequent read. Uh, also, sometimes referred to as a dirty read. <coughs> the second possibility is that you do uh, two reads in a transaction. Um, so transaction one, for example, uh, reads from variable A. Transaction two comes along, modifies A, and then transaction one comes along and reads the value of A again. Well, now you have two different, two reads that have read different values. And this in turn means that transaction one can neither come before nor after uh, transaction two. This is known as an unrepeatable read or a read-write conflict because, excuse me, because you have a read followed by a write. And finally, uh, there's a possibility that uh, two transactions end up overwriting the wrong values. Uh, or more precisely, overwriting the wrong values in the wrong order. So in this case, this is essentially the example that we had earlier, where you do one write for one transaction, then do two writes for, for another transaction, and then overwrite the second trans uh, value with um, the second transaction, the first one. Um, and this is known as a write-write conflict. So essentially, this is, these, these three, operate, or three conflicts, if we can detect them and if we can 
uh, if we can efficiently detect them and decide that two transactions are conflicting, or essentially avoid getting into these uh, conditions in the first place, then we essentially have our way of doing interleaving and serializability. Uh, so, any questions on the conflicts? Okay. Um, let's keep going then. Uh, right. So, now there are a couple of different ways of doing this, this sort of uh, serializability enforcement. And the first, and probably the simplest, is to simply prevent any sort of inconsistency from happening in the first place. Um, how many of you have uh, taken an operating systems course or a distributed systems course with locking? Good, okay. Um, so, just as a quick recap, refresher. Um, Two-phase locking is a, a process where you have Essentially, uh, well, essentially two phases. Uh, one phase where you acquire all of your locks, and then another phase where you release all of your locks. Um, the idea here is that you're basically going to place a reader-writer lock on each object that you're going to uh, want to protect. <coughs> So before you do a, a read, uh, you obtain a reader or a shared lock um, around the, the value that you're interested in reading from. Uh, before you write, you make sure you're the only person with a lock on that object. And you keep these locks until uh, all the way until the transaction completes, uh, at which point you can start releasing them. Now, uh, why, why do this sort of two-phase business? Why not just uh, grab a lock uh, and then release it as soon as you're done writing the, the values. So what's the benefit of, of holding on to the lock until the transaction ends? Uh, could you uh, expand a little? Distributed systems course, or uh, is familiar with locks. So, what can go wrong with 
Wood wants to read uh, read A, then write B. From transaction two wants to uh, read from B and write A. So in this case, um, I can read uh, if both of these processes acquire locks on A and B at the same time. Uh, I mean, they're they're allowed to do that, but then they have to they still have to acquire an exclusive lock if they want to write. So just using reader writer locks doesn't necessarily eliminate the possibility of deadlock. Um, what are some other techniques then? Yes. Um, 
The idea is basically that once a transaction uh, is aborted, anything that it does, anything that, any effect that it had on the database um, has to be undone. So what happens if a second transaction uh, reads a value that has been mod modified by a, a transaction that works? Took a snapshot before, uh, before that value is modified by the other. Okay, so a TJ can read from a snapshot of that value instead. Um, this actually leads to a couple of weird situations. Um, if TJ reads from an earlier value, then you might end up with a situation where TJ uh, can't actually be, uh, there's no serializable order that, that uh, is legitimate. Um, but yes, that would be one way of addressing this. What's another way? Okay, you're right. Um, you are correct. Let me uh, then preface this uh, by with an additional comment. Um, so locking is one way of addressing uh, the, the serializability problem. Um, I should have been clear about this. Uh, locking is one way of, of addressing the serializability problem. Uh, unfortunately, it's extremely, it's typically extremely expensive. Um, so using locking essentially forces you uh, to acquire, uh, basically uh, uh, acquiring locks can be um, depending on how, how complex your transactions are. Uh, acquiring locks can essentially force you into a serializable order anyway. Uh, that is, it, it essentially might force you into a situation where the transactions have to execute one after another, um, regardless of whether or not that's actually necessary or not. Um, one example would be, uh, so earlier we had this example of, um, We have this example of uh, A plus equals 100, B plus equals, uh, minus equals 100, uh, A times equals uh, 1.06, B times equals uh, 1.06. Uh, now, if we were to use the locking mechanism, then we lock A, we lock B, this entire thing has to execute in one go. Uh, whereas transaction two uh, also locks A and B. Uh, so essentially there's, there's no way that these, these two transactions can be interleaved. Do you, uh, do you buy that? Um, on the other hand, we, are, we also established that you can execute these operations uh, in an interleaved order. Um, so essentially the locking approach ends up potentially being uh, eliminating certain possibilities that a certain, inter certain schedules that are equivalent. Um, so as a, a secondary approach, uh, so one of the things we're going to be talking about over the course of the next week is how we, uh, what are some more efficient uh, ways of, what are some, some uh, lower latency ways of essentially achieving the same ends. And if we're not relying on locking, you're, you're absolutely correct that locking would, would prevent this. Um, but what if we don't have locking available? Yes? How about uh, keep log of every, um, I keep log of T, uh, TI, okay. and, um, and logically TJ should be after TI, right? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, so you, uh, you keep uh, two locks, like this is, T, uh, this is TI, this is TJ. Um, when uh, TI is uh, aborted, you uh, roll back, roll, roll back before uh, to the state before TI is executed. 
Okay. We remove TI and we execute TJ. Okay. Um, yeah, that's essentially the, the main approach. So if uh, you have to, if TI aborts, then any transaction that has seen a value that is that was modified by TI um, will have to likewise abort um, and get re-executed. Is there any way of, of sort of salvaging uh, some of that computation? Well, not really. Uh, the database doesn't have any idea what TJ is doing with. So, getting back to the the very first thing I said today, uh, TJ has no way. Uh, the database has no idea of what the, the, the user is doing with the data that it reads from, uh, from TI. Maybe it's just reading it, looking at it, and throwing it away. Uh, the database has no idea. So essentially the database has to abort the entire thing and redo everything from scratch. Uh, okay. <coughs> we have a rule, yes? So would the program have to catch an error? Essentially, yeah. So the, this is analogous to uh, doing a file read. Uh, most of you are probably uh, lazy like I am, and if, uh, if you do a read, uh, a file read, um, how, how many people actually check to see the return value of read? Uh, most reads return the number of bytes actually read. How many people actually check to see if the number of bytes actually read is the number uh, expected? Oh, okay, good, good man. Um, yeah, so basically same thing. Uh, if, if something goes wrong, you may have to re-execute the transaction. Um, okay, uh, yeah, so here's this log. Log helps you do uh, undo's, and we'll talk about uh, the logs and uh, other aspects of concurrency control over the next with that, um, see everyone on Wednesday.